uh, in the five, seven minutes I have left, I'm going to go through um, what I read, just three issues that I took away from this conference and also from our work in, uh, with Canadians in the past. Not to put a fine point on it, and it's rather what you were saying, why are we here? How do we justify uh, spending a million dollars on a survey of Canadians and how they engage the past? And what is the value of knowing that the general public engages the past in their everyday lives? especially as it relates to family and community, however those families and communities are defined. The, the answer, I think, to these questions um, are not only crucial to the survival of our discipline just now, but also, I would argue, to the future of our species on this planet. The times we live in are too liminal and precarious for us to be complacent about the work we do. As Paula Hamilton mentioned, I think it was yesterday, the days are blurring, history is not just for itself, um, but for a purpose. And each and every one of us needs a very good answer to what that purpose is. Uh, for anyone still seeking help in this regard, I direct them to Martha Nussbaum's trilogy, The Fragil Fragility of Goodness, Cultivating Humanity, and Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs Humanities for Some Guidance. You may, may not believe everything she says or agree with everything she says, but it raises what I think are important larger questions that we often miss when we are so tightly focused on that meso level. Our understanding of how citizens gauge the past in their everyday lives is not just about them, those folks out there somewhere. It is also about us. No matter how well educated, reflexive, and adept at research academics are, we too see the past as the general public does. Charles Dickens, Gone with the Wind, Titanic are indelibly imprinted in our minds even if we haven't seen them. We've seen trailers and had references to them. And even if we have the ability to interrogate them closely, those images are with us. Roy Rosenstone, who's written intelligently on the historical film, points out that in order to be true, historical film has to be fictitious. And it's a very complicated argument he has, but I would direct you to it. What is really fictional, I think, um, is the uh, dividing line between us and them, which, if it ever did exist, is certainly dissolving now very quickly under the impact of the new communications technologies. It's so fast that it's making our heads spin, and, and you've mentioned that as well. Our call, one of our colleagues in the survey business, David Thalen, argued that the interest in the past that is revealed in our surveys offers a way forward for dialogue about our, um, the past and what it can offer, both for good and for ill. It can go either way um, as we hurtle into the future. Hands across that fictional divide, I think, is critical. And the infinite archives may be our salvation as the humanities shrink in our universities. And the institutions that were created in the print age, as we know them, um, universities, archives, and so on, get morphed and even may crumble. In our uh, regime of historicity, many of us believe that humans have agency and are not simply swept away by larger forces, providence, or an all-knowing God. If we believe that, if that's what our history tells us, our obligation then is to bring life-affirming values honed by the past experience two liminal moments that confront us now. In my own career, I've seen my work as intensely political, present-minded, and reformist in intent. I make no apology for that. It was always interdisciplinary and collaborative, collaborative with other scholars, with other professional historians, and with the public at large. This is not easy intellectual work, but that is why we are paid the big bucks. We, we need new skills now. Um, indeed, we, we need new arguments as to why, what history is for, but we also need the skills, new computer skills, we need new collaborative skills, and we need new notions of collegiality. And sometimes those are not always present even at this conference. I'll just end by quoting Willard, Willard McCarthy, who is a uh, digital humanist, um, who was writing in the wake of the reforms in Great Britain where the um, funding of history at the university level has been drastically reduced. 
And he makes this point, and I agree with him. Our primary business is creating and fostering a new culture of research that, as it develops, puts quite unusual demands on our social arrangements and those involved in them. We must attract and retain people to help build this new culture, which, in its blending of technical with traditional scholarly modes of work, puts stress on notions of status and interpersonal relations, as well as what we consider research and researchers actually to be. What I fear most for all of us is not the cuts to funding, which holding to our purpose we can survive, but the loss of that purpose through complicity in the industrialization of the humanities. What I fear is that we find ourselves in Charlie Chaplin's place in modern times, on some production line, making widgets for a purpose over which we have no say and which we are likely to have forgotten. Such a fate we cannot survive. Instead of, research, of a research practice, it means a typing pool sort of dying that produces step infection facilitators who are safe from all risk by conforming to the bureaucrat's template of knowledge work. What I fear most to see is us conforming to such a short sort of dying even before it is imposed, rushing to conform, longing for the chains. My desire as urgent as any revolutionaries is for a field populated by brilliant, courageous, and ferociously non-conformist intellectual adventurers who live to find things out, who, played, who live to play in sunlit fields of knowledge. The seven collaborators and 12 community partners that participated in, I think, in our, our Canadians in their past project, I think, lived in such a sunlit field. And we played and we fought sometimes, but we had an awful lot of scope to do what we wanted to do. Future generations of humanities scholars may not be so fortunate, I fear, and that's something I think that we as historians have to take into account. For Willard, um, McCarty it meant that we had to collaborate more in, in struggling for our discipline, but it also means hands across those divides, and that's certainly what happened in our work. This is the last meeting for the, the, the collaborators and the community partners, and it's rather a sad moment for us because we've become rather like siblings, uh, working hard together, trying not to uh, be too critical of each other, and um, reaching our goals as, as best we could. And so I, I think at the end of this, as the rest of you um, have done, to thank Jocelyn for his willingness to take on such a big project and uh, allow University for supporting him. And for, to Jocelyn for bringing together such an incredibly interesting audience. I don't think I've ever been in quite such a group of scholars ever in my career. And it's, it's given me a lot of food for thought, but I'll try not to think up another project like this. <laughs> so at that, I think you're all allowed to rush off to your planes. Jocelyn, you may have something you want to say to finish it off. Well, I'm very confident.